Rich, what's going on? Today's a big talk about toy play. <laughs> not, not that kind of it's toy play. a different play. direction. Oh, no, no, man. It's not that kind of podcast. No, this kind of toy yeah, play. Keep this, it clean. This is what we're talking about today. And I think, um, I think this one can be a little controversial. We know that across the nation, there are some groups that use toys regularly. We know there's some groups that are adamant that they don't use toys at all. And then there are some groups um, that probably just don't have the best understanding of how to implement toys into their training. And uh, that's what we're going to try to do today is clear some of that up. Good. Hey, if you guys are listening to this on our podcast, first off, thank you. Um, second off, this is one of those uh, podcasts that you're going to want to see on YouTube. And in show notes, click on the YouTube uh, link and that should take you there because we're going to show a bunch of videos on this one. Um, because believe it or not, this is one of those topics that uh, can go awry. Uh, I think a lot of handlers have a really good intention of integrating the toy into their training yet the way they integrate it um, has some issues with it. And, and speaking of issues, what, 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 are the, what are some of the reasons I, we hear where they say I'm not, uh, handlers or trainers won't use a toy in training? Yeah, and I, I think it's probably some strong superstition based on stuff that they've seen out there. One of them is that the dog is going to come back and always demand the toy. The dog is you know used to playing with the toy. The dog gets done doing its work, whatever it is you're doing, and it's coming back and it's being uh, pushy for the toy, even to the point of being violently pushy for the toy and demanding something and then maybe the toy doesn't get presented and obviously a big concern is that a dog might come back and try and go for your your uh, handgun which could be a huge problem yeah absolutely that's one of the big ones i hear is oh they're going to bite my gun they're, they're going to confuse the gun with the toy and we're going to show you some ways to to kind of work around that right on this podcast uh, what are some of the other ones uh suspects throwing backpacks throwing and and i mean and we've seen that unintentionally I think be successful in the past where a suspect has thrown something at the dog maybe to uh, try and hurt the dog or scare the dog and the dog's like hey look at this I've got a I've got a backpack which you know a backpack or a, a duffel bag resembles some of the toys that we use and the dog's like hey this this is great I'm going to hang out with this I don't need to go after the suspect anymore mm-hmm. I've also heard that hey this is these are these aren't these are goddamn police dogs they're not sport dogs that's way too sporty for that for for what we're doing um, the dog needs to release because I tell him to. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a, a common concern, and I think that's a belief with a lot of handlers and trainers that the dog has to do what I said to do because I said to do it. And I think, and I don't mean to get too into the weeds on this, but I think in the 1950s there was a way of parenting children that's probably a little different than it is now, um, and it was all because I told you to do it. But maybe there's some value in, hey, why don't you do this and I'm going to make it fun for you. I'm going to make it exciting for you. I'm going to make it valuable for you. So you want to do what I say. And I think that's where the toy and food comes into the play where we're asking the dogs to do things that are really important to us. Let go of bad guys. Uh, Come back to us when we ask them to come back to us. Have good obedience where we can rely on them on and off leash. And they're doing it because they want to do it because there's hope and value that we're going to play a game with them. Hey, one more. Um, my dog, if you do that, your dog won't out unless the toy is there. Yeah, absolutely. You become reliant on the toy, right? Yeah, and I think that's what we're going to get into, how the toy play develops for dogs. And, and this is one of those things where we're going to get into markers and classical conditioning. And um, I, we've all heard about it. We've all gone to classes, seminars, talk to trainers, know the science that, you know, classical conditioning and markers really helps dogs learn. But sometimes um, we don't have a full grasp of what exactly that means. Mm -hmm. So Greg is going to give us a impromptu, short, to the point, less sciencey version of classical condition and loading a marker and teaching the dog marker and how that applies to your dog. Yeah. So real quick, I mean, classical conditioning really changed the way we communicate with our dogs. Here's our issue in dog training. We have a very motivated dog, and generally our dogs are very motivated by a toy, and most of the dogs we're selecting nowadays have a super high interest and drive to interact with that toy. So we've got the motivation. Where we've lacked is in our communication. We've missed the opportunity to show the dog exactly what we want. And you have either you have around a half second to either reward or punish a certain behavior. And that's where our communication starts lacking because we want to deliver a toy reward or a piece of kibble or something for the dog uh, to let him know that that's a behavior we want 
yet our timing is slow. You know, the dog is in the present, he's in the now, you have to capture that behavior or he's not gonna relate the toy or the punishment with that behavior. So that's been our challenge. So uh, there's something called classical conditioning. And uh, if you guys remember in school, somewhere in high school, potentially college, they talk about Pavlov's dogs. And basically what it is is Pavlov had a, a number of dogs and every night the dogs would be fed. And before the feeders opened, a bell would go off. So a bell would go off, the feeder delivered food into their bowls. A bell would go off, a feeder would deliver food in their bowls. And this happened over and over again until one day the bell went off, the feeder got jammed, there was no food delivered by the feeding system, and the dogs salivated. And so basically, you took something that means nothing to a dog, such as a bell. You know, a dog is not born understanding the bell, having any relationship with the bell. Um, and the bell went off, and when it was paired with the food, the dog had a physiological response of salivating. So now the bell essentially takes on the, the represent the, the importance of the food. So uh, I heard this years ago and, and I was like, that's really cool. Now let me get back to my I Keeler got, style I training. <laughs> <laughs> I got dogs, I got to yank around and get them into a sit and a down. And so um, it really revolutionized the way we train our dogs or it should have if, if you're using markers. And, and a lot of people like to use the comparison with, um, you know, you go to SeaWorld and they're training dolphins and things like that. And how are they training these dolphins to do these behaviors when they can't deliver a fish while the dolphin is going through a hoop, a fire or whatever, doing a backflip. They can't get the fish to them. So they're using a marker system, and, and our dogs are no different. They, uh, they respond very well to it, and it will clean up your communication. If you get nothing out of this podcast, I mean, understanding how to use markers is, is a foundation and a staple to most, most training organizations. Uh, and I'm going to interrupt a little bit. And you, whether you know you are or not, if you don't think that you're using classical conditioning, your dog is being or has been classically conditioned to something that you've done. We hear it all the time. It's like, hey, every time I turn on my overheads uh, to go to an emergency call, my dog starts to lose his mind. So as what your dog has done is it's paired the sound of the overheads, whether it's a siren or just the electrical communication that happens with the switch, to you driving fast, you grabbing the leash and pulling the dog out of the car when you show up to the scene and him having the opportunity to then go uh, find somebody and, and potentially apprehend them. So that's all very exciting to the dog. So now you're driving down the street and as all you want to do is pull somebody over to give them a speeding ticket and you turn on your lights and your dog loses his mind in the, in the back seat and you try and talk on the radio and as all you hear is your, typically, your shepherd screaming in the back seat about what it wants to do. So your dog has become classically conditioned to that Problem. unconditioned stimulus, yes. you're the light switch, and it's excited now. Uh, in the pet world for us, it's people wanting to take their dog for a walk. Hey, buddy, let's go for a walk. They put on their shoes, grab their car keys, head to the front door. A week into that, grab your shoes, put on your car keys, and you're getting ready to go to work, and your dog's now slamming himself against the front door mm -hmm. because the dog's been classically conditioned that that means this. And it cannot help itself. And Armin talked about this when we had Armin I was on. to bring that up. When the dog yeah. is classically conditioned, it cannot help itself but to have a response. It's not making a choice. It's doing it because it has a physical, physiological response to that unconditioned stimulus. And it now means something to the dog that it never met before. Yeah. So it's, uh, so it's not, it, and I think like you hit the nail on the head right there, Rich, is the dog is not making the conscious decision. So your dog, when you hit those overheads, we've paired it, or you're making your announcement at the door, and they start barking, um, some of that, there's not thought behind it. It's just been conditioned. Just like the dog salivating at the bell. Like, he didn't make that decision to salivate. It was a physiological response. So whenever you're dealing with something that's a classical condition issue versus maybe an operant conditioning issue, you have to kind of look at why the dog is doing it, and your solution is going to probably have to alter, right? So, But if it's classically conditioned, it is a lot uh, – it's – way more difficult to to reshape that behavior so um. and in today's podcast we're going to talk about markers and the marker that we are going to use just so it's clear across the board is the word yes um, just for clarification you could use the word good you could use the word yes you can use clickers uh, there's all kinds of things that you can do <laughs> obviously car keys in the front door your your overhead lights all of those things could be used as you know a, a, a stimulus to create that but for the sake of this podcast, we're going to use the word yes as our marker. Yeah, correct. And so, 
<laughs> and here's the thing. If you guys are using whatever marker you're using, um, and if you're using yes, just understand it has a lot to do with the tone and the delivery versus the word. Because yes, yes, yes. Like those are all three different things to the dog. So whatever marker you're going to use, try to deliver it the same way every time, and that'll have a lot more success with your dog. So, Rich, you want to get into how we're going to load this marker? Uh, absolutely. I almost said yes. Now, now you've got me a little gun shy. <laughs> so it's what we do in the beginning, and we do this with pet dogs. We do it with police dogs. If a dog comes to us from Eastern Europe, comes to us from Canada, comes to us from Tennessee, comes to us from the old lady down the street, whatever it is, we start off with the same process. We put the dog in front of us, and we expect no behavior from the dog, and we start with food. So in the beginning, I would say, yes, and I say it just like that because that's not how I talk. If Greg asked me, you know, hey, do you want me to grab lunch for you? And I say, yes, I don't want to have to owe the dog anything. So I use yes in a kind of a high-pitched, cutesy voice just because it's unique to the dog. I start, I say, yes. I give the dog food within about a half a second to a second and a half after saying that. And I do that repeatedly. Yes, food. Yes, food. Over and over and over again, and I do that when we're loading the marker, we do several sessions a day, and then we do several days in a row of that. Within two or three days of loading the marker and giving the dog food after yes is what we see pretty quickly is when I say yes, the dog starts to look at me, lips start to quiver a little bit, it starts to expect something after that yes. At some point when I say yes, and the dog looks up and it's starting to salivate and it's expecting something from me, I know it's understanding it. I know it feels what the marker word is and it's having a physiological response to it that it can no longer control so at some point when the dog's fucking off in the living room doing its thing and i say yes and it turns around and looks at me like whoa where's my food then i know that that dog has a marker loaded into it and it's been classically conditioned that that sound equals food mm -hmm. and then we and then we start to move on from there what kind of food do you usually use and that depends on the dog. I, we use a neck shuck, obviously, uh, because one, they're our sponsor, and two, it's what we feed every dog that comes into our building. Um, but that is a good question because you might get a dog, uh, say from Europe, that's been eating the raw diet for the last eight months. It's, a, it's only had, um, you know, raw chicken legs. So if I'm using that as a reward, that gets a little messy. So you might have to withhold some food for a day or two so the dog understands that the food that you have is valuable to the dog. I do always prefer to use kibble because it's cheaper and it's easier to give to the dog. It's not messy. But if you have a dog that won't take kibble as a reward, then you have to find something that's more valuable. Yeah, and one, one important point here is it is super important that the marker precedes the treat. Um, they did another study where they had the bell and food come out at the same time and the dogs did not pair it the same. So as humans, trust me, this is one of those things that's, um, they call it simple, but it's not easy. So as humans, we want to like talk and deliver the food at the same time. And later on, we do the same thing with the toy. Use the marker, count a second in your head and then produce the, the treat and later on produce the toy. So that's the beauty of the marker is uh, we, it buys us time in between the dog's behavior and us delivering the reward. I mean, it can buy five, six, seven, eight seconds uh, from the time of the marker. Absolutely. And, and on that same note, not only does it buy us time, it buys us respect, right? So if I walk into a room and I have the tug with me and I haven't said the marker, then the dog knows it doesn't get the toy. The thing that gets the toy is the marker. And we'll you know, obviously talk about that as we move on. But I think uh, we're, we were looking at the LEO discussion page today and somebody was having an issue with delivering a toy. And a lot of times the cargo pant becomes the marker inadvertently, mm -hmm. right? The dog goes into odor. The handler goes to get a toy out of the cargo pant. Shh, that shh becomes the marker. And the dog is rewarded right then. And then it spins around to be like, hey, where's the shit you just promised me? So um, it buys you time and it buys you respect from the dog. So let's talk about that, Rich. So we got our dog. Uh, we started our, with a marker. We're going to use yes. We're delivering the, the word the same every single time. And then we're waiting a second. Then we're delivering the food. Now we say yes. The dog has a physiological response. You can see, oh, oh something good's coming, right? And now we want to integrate the toy. What's our next step? So for me, this is, and we talked about this earlier also, this depends on the type of dog that you have. So I'm going to use kind of our most difficult situation. Uh, we get a dog that's about 14 months old, and it comes to us from some uh, Eastern European country where the dog has been taught its entire life that a ball on a rope 
means everything to them. And there's not a lot of rules combined with this other than go find it and then we play with it and it's the top of the world. And then when we're ready to take this away from you, Look we, out. we choke you off of it. Yep. And then we're having to fight to separate the dog from this. So this is super meaningful to the dog. The reason why I bring up that situation is because when you start to load a marker with this toy with a dog that came from Eastern Europe and has all it's done is gotten this and been separated from it by force, this is super meaningful and it's not always easy to just put Fido on a leash and then hold that toy there and kind of start this process. So as what we do with dogs like that is we back tie them. We have them on the harness or on their flat collar and we back tie them to uh, with a strap that's strong and sturdy to a uh, pole or a fence post, something else that's sturdy that we don't have to worry about anything failing and the dog launching and getting one of us. So we back tie it to it and we start the same process that we did with the dog food. So we hold this out in front of the dog and we say, yes. And then we deliver this to the dog, play with it a little bit. Um, and we do that repeatedly. The problem is initially the dog's not going to want to let go of this. So we say, yes, dog plays with this. We let go of it. It goes dead. This is in the dog's mouth. It's dead. It's not as fun as it once was. I bring out the next live one. I move it around a little bit, make a little bit of noise. The dog spits this one. I now mark it again. Yes. And I give it this one. And we do that repeatedly. Let go of one, mark it, get this one. Let go of this one, mark it, get this one. And it's always letting go of the one that's dead. So if I hold on to this and I continue to play tug with the dog, it's going to be much less likely to let go of this. So I let this go completely dead. It's just sitting in the dog's mouth. Nothing's fun about it. And I bring out the next promise of excitement, move this around, make it exciting. He spits that one. I say, yes, and he gets this one. So it's what he's starting to learn is letting go of the dead bird gets me to play with the live bird. Mm -hmm. And the only way I'm getting that is through the, through the marker word of yes. A couple quick points here. So number one, when we select our dogs, we select dogs specifically that want the interaction with the toy and not just the toy. If you have a very possessive dog and they grab the toy and they want nothing to do with you and your live bird, right? Yeah. They don't want your bird. Right. Um, they got their dead bird and they're happy with their dead bird. That's problematic. And you are generally going to have to fight this dog for your outs and releases on, on decoys. And I think on people ultimately, cause, um, that that's, that's ingrained in the dog. So when we select a dog, I will give a dog a toy and we will let them have that toy and then I'll have another toy and I'll make it really, you know, um, enticing to the dog. And when the dog spits out the dead toy or the dead bird and comes in for the live one, then I know I've got, I've got something that he wants, even though he's got possession of a bite. It's always the one that's alive is, is what the dog should really uh, desire. So it's, it should be about the interaction, not about the toy. And if you select it properly, and the vast majority of dogs will do this and some of them might take a little bit more and they're different parts of the scale but the majority of dogs you can work through this to a certain degree it is a dog it's in the dog nature i mean we've all maybe you've not owned a dog that have done this but we've been around dogs that have broken into a chicken coop and they've killed 30 chickens and not eaten any of those chickens because the excitement is in thrashing the chickens and then it dies and like oh this is boring i'm going to go do the next 29 we have a schnauzer. She does the same thing with squirrels. She grabs them. She shakes them. She moves on to the next one. Um, there's no value in eating that. It is a dangerous proposition to pick up a dog that wants to take this tug, go over to the corner and not let anybody have it and not share it and not come to the fun one. That is a challenge and you're going to be, your hands are going to be full. And that is where you're going to definitely have to use some compulsion to make the dog let go. But then we're still going back to marking on getting the next one. It's mm -hmm. just going to be a little a little dicier of a game. Sure. So ideally in the learning process, if, 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 if you go back to fundamental learning, the dog offers a behavior and you're there to reward that behavior, the dog came up with it on his own, right? Like that was his, his idea. And um, that's a much more solid behavior than if right out of the gate we're compulsing and making him drop the other one and then rewarding it. So I think doing this little extra step and having the dog think it's his idea to let go of this toy to play with the other one, I think it really sets a nice foundation. And that's why we use the back tie. The back tie does give you a little uh, version of safety, right? When it's on the back tie and the dog is up here, I can step back here. And if he doesn't let go of it, then I just wait. And at some point he lets go of it. But I'm not getting 
if you were to take that same 14 month old dog from Eastern Europe and I have the dog in the leash here and the toy here, that becomes a dicey proposition also, right? Have the dog jumping all over the place. It's trying to mug me for the toy. And no matter how good we are and how skilled we are at doing this, a hunter or an 80 pound Malinois jumping for a ball on a rope or a tug when we don't want those two things to meet uh, is not difficult to, or is not easy to control. So in that vein, what happens when you're playing this little game and you get nipped, you get bit unintentionally going for the toy. For me, if the dog nips me and it happens all the time and one, I stay calm. I don't lose my mind and become the prey that he, you know, accidentally grabbed onto. I correct to that behavior. Ah, uh-uh, let go. As soon as he's off that, we're right back on the toy and I make no big deal about it, but he does have to get corrected if he bites my hand. He's not, this is not fair play. And if I want to continue to keep playing with him and training him, he can't touch my hands. Sure. Uh, we, we believe the dog needs to watch where he's putting his teeth, right? And that's his responsibility. It's not the handler's responsibility to deliver it perfectly every single time. So guys, here's the deal. Um, if you have elected to become a canine handler, you have elected to essentially get bit at some point in time. So my recommendation is deal with this on the front end, get over with it, teach the dog that that's not acceptable, and then you push on. Because I've seen guys, they're trying to dance around with the dog, and the dog hasn't really learned that skill, and it becomes like this lifelong thing of afraid to get bit. Uh, Now, having said that, let's set this thing up in our favor and invest in a couple of really good gloves right? When you play this, we just said that the dog's main goal is the interaction with the toy, not the toy itself. Like that's really what satiates the drive. So if that is true, then when the dog bites you inadvertently and you correct him with a leash correction and the toy becomes dead and the bird becomes dead, right? We're adding positive punishment with the correction. And then we're using negative punishment by taking away the interaction. And you can even give a, 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 you know, no. And then pause, and then reset the game up, and then let him come in and learn to bite the toy properly. And he will learn the only way the game begins if he bites the toy properly and doesn't bite your hands. And in the beginning, if you are feeling really concerned about this, uh, when you start these tugs with the handles, keep your hands out to the side. So the only thing that the dog can see is the tug itself. As time goes on, you should be able to hold it something like this, and the dog understands that this area in between my hands is the only place to start. Or only place to, uh, to to bite. But I don't know if I'm even willing to start this with that 14-month-old Eastern European mm-hmm, mm-hmm. dog. Like, that's a lot to ask. So you make it very safe for yourself, and then you move in gradually so the dog understands that all of this is off limits, only the tug is on limits. Same thing with the ball on the rope. If we're using the ball on the rope, I like to set this at about a 45-degree angle above the dog's nose. So the only thing it sees is the target, which is the ball itself. The problem is with both of these things, if I get nervous and I get scared and the dog misses it or it's jumping at me and I start flinging it, I've now become that live bird again, right? If I want it to sit there and calmly not bite this and I'm moving around from it because... Like, I'm, now we're having fun. Now it's a party, right? <laughs> and I've become the party and everything from my you know elbow down to my to the ball here is in... in so, chill out. Yeah, and I'm telling you, get some gloves. And I say this every handler class, and everybody's like, eh, whatever. And then somebody takes one in the thumb or in the webbing of their their hand, and next thing, everybody's coming out with gloves. So get a good pair of gloves. Hey, there's something else you can do, too, to make this a little little easier. What we tend to do as cops is we go out, and everything we own is black. As far as we got black tugs, we got a black uniform or dark blue uniform. We got black gloves, right? Our sleeves are now black. Um, So... Something to think about is dogs see two colors really well, blue and yellow. And so uh, when you're selecting a toy, uh, a bright green tug uh, helps as well, or um, even a red tug is better than a black tug. But get a different color tug because I'll watch the dog come back to the handler. The handler's got black gloves with a black tug, and they've got it against their uniform or their vest, and the dogs are coming in and, and... I mean, these dogs are coming back sometimes pretty quick, right? And they're, they're, some of these dogs we select are super fast. So just make it a little easier for your dog and go to a color tug in the beginning and make it easier on you and go to gloves while you work through this part of the process. Yep. And so recap really quick before we go into how we get him to let go is we're using this marker. We have the toy in front of the dog that's back tied in a safe position. We say, yes, dog gets that toy. 
we let that toy go dead. It's in the dog's mouth. We grab the next toy, shake it around a little bit, make it come alive. Dog spits the first toy. We say, yes, and then it gets this toy. Yes, and you're basically setting up the paradigm that you're going to, from from the beginning to the end, the dog never gets to bite the toy unless you mark it. And this is going to clear up a lot of issues later on. Um, so very from the very get-go, my dog is never going to bite my toy unless I mark it, and then he gets it. Absolutely. Okay. Moving on to outing because we are telling the dog to let go. Yes. <laughs> still requires two toys in the beginning because we still want the dog to understand that when it lets go, the value comes from letting go to start the game over again. So now we've let the dog understand that like, hey, you see this exciting one, spit that one out and get this one. Now we're going to add a word to it. So it's got that tug in its mouth. It's playing with that tug. We let go. We make it go dead. We say, out, los, whatever, whatever your out word is. We'll just say, out, hang out there with the, with the next toy. Dog spits it. Yes. So now there's a word associated with letting go of the toy. Yeah. So a couple pieces here, right? Um, the old saying is don't name it until you love it. So do not start telling the dog to release out or los until they are giving that behavior predictably. Um, I see this as a mistake too soon. Guys go los and the dog doesn't los, los. And now you're on los three or four and he decides to spit it out. No, wait until you see the dog and he understands the game and he's, you can already see he's getting ready to spit it out. Then you start putting that command in, right? And then, and as we progress throughout this game, you can even start to add a little bit of either negative reinforcement or positive punishment with the E um, if the dog doesn't give the behavior once he has an understanding of it, right? So that's a little farther down. I like to use a little negative reinforcement where we're overlaying the E at super low levels um, just as the dog gets to let go. Um, so I, I don't want to muddy the waters here. And we discussed how this can really take a, a bunch of different branches and go down a bunch of different paths. But, but really the concept there, like Rich said, is once the dog is giving the behavior predictably, that's when you give your, your out command. And I think this is an important part to jump ahead just so we can see, we can forecast where this is all going. We talked about it in the beginning, classical conditioning. The dog has no choice but to respond in a certain way. He can't tell his body not to. That's how the dog is responding. So is what we're doing now is we're classically conditioning the dog that when he lets go, something good is going to happen. The value in that is down the line, your dog goes into the woods, goes under a house, goes into a car, and bites somebody that you sent him on. And now you're ready to get him back. And you say, Fido, out. And the dog, boom. It spits it because thousands and thousands of repetitions of letting go has resulted in a positive reaction for the dog, and the dog wants to have that positive reaction again. So without understanding why, you say the word out on the man, and the dog spits it because that's just what he's done. And he doesn't know why he spit it, but he heard you say it, and he lets go, and it feels good to him to let go, not because you went up and said, motherfucker, out. That's a whole different beast. Well, and, and the reality is, is the dogs that we have now are way different than the dogs that we had 30 years ago. We are selecting some really high drive, highly motivated dogs, but yet sensitive at yeah. times, right? So the importance of using these toys is, you know, um, and, and I know when the Malinois first came to the States, everybody went, wow, that's a lot of drive. I'm really, really have to use a lot of compulsion <laughs> and a lot of corrections to get that dog clean. What we've learned is make the dog want the same thing. You want to work with these dogs, the dog's drive. You don't want to fight the drive. Um, and that's, you're setting yourself up for failure. And when you start fighting the drive, that's when you either shut down a dog or handlers start to get bit. Um, either one you don't want, right? So um, that's another important reason why we're using the toys and, um, you know, trying to make the dog want the same thing. So um, something important, too, is when you're, you're teaching a dog any behavior, what stage do we start out in? Luring right? We do it with food, right? We're doing it with the tug on the outs. Hey, here's another toy. You can now uh, earn this other toy by letting go of this toy. And then at a certain point, once the dog is doing that predictably, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I don't know. I was hoping you knew. Oh. This, this is awkward now. <laughs> no, we're going to remove the lure, right? And now the, this toy is going to go away and we're going to ask for the dog to release that, that toy, and we're going to overlay a little positive punishment. He already should understand the word. We've been, we've been conditioning the word, so he should have an understanding of it. A little positive punishment. 
whether that's an e-collar correction, whether it's a leash correction, the dog spits it out, then guess what? Marker comes, and then another toy comes out. And I think that's important to understand the value in doing all this positively, which means you know every time we the dog does something that we wanted to do, it gets a reward for doing that, is down the line, I may have to, very likely, with a high-drive dog, say, no, I said let go. But I've now bought a relationship with my dog over multiple times of the dog being rewarded where it's not just me going up to this new dog that I met and kicking his ass and making him do something because I said it. There's always already been some joy and uh, fun in it. So when I have to say, hey, dude, I said let go. I know you're excited about this, but now it's time to let go. I have enough of a relationship with the dog. There's been enough fun associated with it. There's enough positive association with that that he's like, okay, I'll let go because it's, it's pretty fun to hang out with you. So uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, from Joel Monroe, uh, discipline without rapport equals rebellion. And every time you take your dog out and you're working the toy and you're rewarding him with a toy, you're putting money in the bank. So that day when, as Rich said, dog makes a conscious decision to be disobedient, and you come in and you're going to punish him for that disobedience, you've already got enough uh, money in the bank, you got enough clout, you've got a rapport with this dog. He's like, oh, okay, I had that one coming. And now I'm going to say, okay, now I'm going to show you how to earn that toy and give me the proper behavior. Oh, and there's the toy. And that's kind of the balance of dog training. I think it's like us, right? Like, I mean, we've all worked for a boss who's just a dick because he's a dick uh, for no good reason and you don't have any rapport and everything that person says makes you want to argue with it. And we've worked with somebody who's really cared about how your day is going, how work's going. They care about your family. They care about your well-being. They're making sure that work's easier for you. There's a path to success. And then when that person has to deliver bad news to us or, you know, you end up having to work an overtime shift, or you're like, yeah, I can take it from that guy because he cares about me. Mm-hmm. You want to have that same relationship with your dog. So next step. Now we're going to – the dog is predictably giving us a release on the toy. Now we need to teach the dog that he cannot bite it unless it, the marker has preceded it. Right. So uh, and this is really an important piece because this is where it's going to set up the foundation for later on. And some of the issues that we had talked about in the beginning, if it's not clear to the dog when he can bite the toy and when he can't bite the toy, then now you're leaving it up to interpretation. And that's where we run into problems. Right. We're in a gray area is is the way I like to put it. I want to keep this really black and white, really clear for the dog. Dogs are happier. They're more confident. You have a better relationship if the expectations are super clear. So. One of the things we'll do, and you can, again, be on the back tie, but, and you'll have the dog on a leash, but I will give the, opportun- the dog an opportunity to bite the tug. Uh, when he goes to bite it, I tell him no. I, I give a little bit of a correction. He backs off. He relinquishes it, and you'll just see him resign. Oh, I'm not supposed to bite it. And then when he gives me that behavior, yes, now he gets to have the toy. So I've taught him, no, you don't get to bite it just because it's in front of your nose. But when you relinquish it, when you're giving me a behavior, and like Rich said, now the dog learns, oh, the path to get to the toy is through obedience. Man, now we're off and running. Yeah. And it's just that little bit of time in the, in the beginning, we're developing the excitement for it. Like, hey, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. This is a really fun game, right? So now we know the dog wants to engage with it. And now you just withhold it for a little second. I ask him to sit. I ask him to down something when he lets go of it. And he's like, fuck, I really want that. But he's a foot away and it's over here. What do I need to do? And you'll see in the beginning, they might jump up. They might bark. They might do all kinds of crazy behavior. It doesn't matter. He's not getting it. Like Greg says, now he settles down, drops his butt to the ground. Yes. Here's the toy again. The dog learns like, oh, there's something else that I have to do. I'm capping my behavior. I still want it as bad as I wanted it before. But I have to add a little moment of clarity before I get it. And that's where, I mean, we're going to use that for the rest of the dog's life, right? It's going to see a bad guy. It's not time to chase him yet. Wait. Okay, go get that bad guy. It's going to be a a door to a building. Police department with the dog. Come out now. It's not time to go yet. Okay, go get him. Like the dog's going to have to learn to cap before it gets what it wants. And this is where we start. We start with the toy. Here it is. You know, you want it. We just had a whole bunch of sessions of get it, get it, get it, get it. But now sit, get it. That's, uh, and that's what, again, this is what we're going to use for the rest of the dog's life to keep it motivated, but also to keep it controlled. And those two things are super necessary with high drive dogs. Yeah. So before we get into obedience with this, we need two things. Number one, the dog can't molest you for the toy. And we're setting that foundation up by you don't get to bite it unless we mark it, right? So and we've done that on the back tie. 
Um, we've set ourselves up for, for success on that. As Rich said, if you got a freaking dog just from Eastern Europe that is a nut for the toy, you're going to have to do this foundation before you bring a toy out in obedience or even bite work. Um, it's necessary. So, and it's going to save you a lot of heartache throughout, throughout your training career with this dog. So the dog doesn't molest you for it. And then the, uh, the, the second thing you need is he needs to release the toy when you tell him to. Otherwise, you get out there, you try to use your toy in obedience. He does something good, you give him the toy, and now you're fighting with him for five minutes and choking him off a toy to get your toy back. It deteriorates. So you need those two things. Dog won't molest you, and the dog will release when given the command. Yeah, and then and this is the point where, you know, at some point you're going to grab your dog out of the car and you're going to have your toy on you, and the dog's going to be like, hey, we've had a lot of excitement with that. And any dog worth its salt should at some point be like, hey, let me have that. That looks like fun. And you're going to be like, hey, knock it off. And the dog's like, whoop, sorry. Good. Yes. Sorry. Yes. And then we play with the toy. So behavior we don't like, the dog bugging us for it gets corrected now because we've set a foundation. And then behavior we do like gets marked and the dog gets the toy. Also in that foundation, you're going to have gone from two toys being present, out this one, I got another one, out this one, I got another one, back and forth to having one toy, once we've gotten to that point where he's outing predictably, he understands the command, I can overlay a little pressure, he understands how to give to pressure, release the toy, he gets another toy back, to just doing one toy, where we tell him to release, he releases, and then we mark it, and he gets the toy back again. And that we do for the life of the dog. We are constantly out, here, here's it back, out, here's it back, out. Okay, I'm going to put it in my pocket. I'll give you another way to earn it through obedience or through bite work and releasing or something else. Um, but that's that's something that you need to reinforce constantly. And I think this is one of the ones where we see handlers fall off a lot is they, you know, you ask the dog to sit, you ask the dog to recall or the dog's doing detection, something where it gets rewarded with the toy and then they're just done and they go back to the car and the next time they take the dog away from the toy, they're at the car and they're done. Every once in a while, after this whole process is done, whether you're rewarding, again, for whether it be detection or a recall or just playing with your dog, make your dog let go and then immediately reward it for letting go so the dog understands throughout its nine, ten years of workability that whenever it lets go, there's a chance that it's going to get re-rewarded. There's hope that it's going to get re-rewarded for just letting go. And then the game starts again so that three years down the line, you haven't taught your dog to stop letting go. Sure. And you can uh, end, end your training session with letting the dog carry the toy back to the car. And then I offer him water. And then he goes, oh, I want some water. He spits the toy out. He drinks the water. I put the toy in my pocket, tell him load up after he's drank. So um, you can be creative with what the reward after letting go of the toy. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about moving into obedience now with the toy. And this will be as we actually start to do, um, you know, what would be considered classical obedience, your healing, your sits, your downs, your recalls, those kind of things and where you want to start uh, kind of luring and showing the dog the, the potential for the toy reward in that situation. Sure. And one quick thing, Rich, before we move on, um, something I see a lot of handlers do is they will out the dog from the toy, and then they bring it up here like this, like, uh, uh, I got it, and it goes away. Um, think of this as, as the bird, and they out the bird, and the bird flies away. You know, I usually, we usually determine it as like it's a rabbit, and the rabbit is going, you're igniting that drive. Um, and you're not teaching the dog to properly release a toy. So if you're that handler where you're outing him and the toy goes away real quick and you put it in your pocket, uh, 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 you got to leave it alone, um, get over the fact of like, I don't want the dog to fail. I don't want him to grab the toy. You know, let's let him fail. Let's let him grab the toy so I can teach him that that is not an option no longer. So when you out have your dog release that toy, we keep it right there in front of his nose. And so the dog outs the toy. I'm playing with my dog. He outs. Um, I put him in a sit. I put that toy right in front of his nose to see if he makes that op. So that option to rebite without a marker isn't there. If it is, he bites it, then that's the stage we're at. Like, we're going to stay there until we work through this. But he does it properly. We mark it and give it to him. Um, And so when he goes to bite it and I haven't told him to, I add pressure, and the toy doesn't move. It stays right there. And I, th- I think a lot of problems also are in the guy's toys work where they're kind of keeping tension on that toy and you're inadvertently keeping that rabbit or bird alive as you're trying to out them. So make sure that thing stays still. Yeah, it helps to kind of actually push in a little bit towards the dog's mouth. It makes it feel very limp mm-hmm. for the dog. And, and to further uh, talk about what you were saying, it's really important that the dog and you understand that this is your tug. 
It's not the dog's tug. This is your dog, your tug that you're sharing with the dog. The fun comes from you. It all comes through you. It's not just the existence of the toy that matters. So when you tell the dog to let go, and if I hold that in front of his nose and he's trying to steal it, he still believes that it's his toy. He doesn't understand the capping. He doesn't understand the marker. And he doesn't understand whose toy it is. Those are things that have to be cleared up before we move on. And, that, and that's why it's good to have that back tie for all the safety purposes and a clear delineation of like, no, you don't get it until you're acting right. Yep. And then once we have this foundation, now we can start using it in obedience. So uh, one of the things we will do early on uh, to teach a dog proper positioning is, again, the dog now respects the toy. He knows he doesn't get it unless uh, there's been a marker preceding it, is we put it under our, if we're healing on our left, we put the toy under our left arm. It puts him in proper position as he's looking up at the toy. We start healing. We say, we use our marker, yes. Then we, we drop the toy to the dog. If the dog jumps up and grabs the toy, um, we're going to give a correction right there. We ne he needs to learn that he just doesn't jump up and grab, again, grab me or grab any part of me or my shirt or anything like that. Um, and this is the lowering stage for, for our healing. And again, and, and it puts them in a perfect position, but we can't, we can't linger here. And uh, we'll see a lot of handlers out there that they're either, they're doing this, they're healing around with the toy, see if it, and up here, and they're, they're walking around, and, and, they're, and they're, they're a year into it, and it's like they, they miss the whole concept of this lure has got to go away. Once the dog understands a heel and he knows to look up at you and you've been marking it, you gotta, you got to push forward. Yeah, and I think... We get frustrated because we see that and we we know better and we try and get that word out. But it, it's easy, right? Like if I'm walking a dog and I want a really flashy heel and I'm not doing the work, the best way to get that flashy heel is to hold the toy there because the dog's looking at it. And there's, But you got to realize that when the dog is staring at the toy, looking at the toy as a lure, it's not looking at you to present it. It's staring at the reward. So staring at the reward while it's doing something that you want it to do, if you'll see it once you take that reward away. If you haven't taught the dog the marker and you haven't taught it some duration and you haven't taught the ability for the dog to focus on you as the handler and then get rewarded for focusing on you, it's all a facade. It's not real. That's not real obedience and it's not real focus. It just deteriorates. Once yeah. you take the toy out of it, it deteriorates. Yeah. So how are we going to fix that? We're going to hide the toy and we're going to reward short spurts of what we're looking for. So if we're looking for focus and a heel, if we like when the dog looks up at us, uh, we like that look that the dog was doing when we had the toy here, then we're going to expect the same behavior, but we're going to take the toy away. The toy is going to go off to our side. The dog's not going to be able to see it. It's going to look up at us and we're going to say, yes, and then we're going to present the toy. So just looking up at us is going to get the marker, which the dog understands from our thousands of repetitions that we've done prior to this, that yes means a good thing and a reward is coming. So when it looks up at us, it's going to hear yes. And now the lure slowly becomes our eyes. I'm looking up at you, boss. That's what you wanted, right? Yes. Boom. And it gets the reward. Yeah. So real quick here, if you've got the toy underneath your arm and you can heal hundred yards, right turn, left turn, and you go to remove the toy, immediately go back to rewarding, like Rich said, on the, as soon as he looks up at me, I'm going to mark it and I'm going to re, I'm going to reward him. Um, because it's almost like you got to go back to basics and trust me, it goes quick. Once they learn like, oh, okay, I'll give you the same behavior. I just don't need the toy there. Then you're off and running. So, but, but don't expect you're going to have the same obedience once you remove this, but it's, it's a quick stage from, this being present to this not being present, but just reward it frequently and early in the beginning. And it might be like Rich said, he might just fall right into position, look up for one step, boom, I'm marking it. And then I'm coming with the toy, which brings us into toy delivery. Toy delivery on this one. And this is, um, there's a couple ways that we can reward the toy, but this is where we get into the situation that people were worried about in the beginning. I don't want my dog biting my gun. Solid, solid. It's good concern. Solid concern. I don't either. <laughs> solid concern to have. So we like to reward behind our back at about a 45 degree angle to the rear side of the dog. And in this situation, uh, what Greg pointed out is, you know, when we were luring in the beginning on the left side, consider for the sake of this conversation that we are doing that on the off side of the gun, right? So for us, we're both right-handed guns on the right side. So we're going to lure on the left, deliver on the left. But if 
you're left-handed and your gun is on your left side, flip the script on everything you're talking about. So now we have the dog. Dog's walking in a heel. It looks up at us, has good uh, focus on our face area. We like that. We mark it. Yes. Behind our back, we throw the toy, and uh, we like to start on the, against a wall. And the reason we start on the wall is when we throw the toy, the tug slams against the wall. Here's a little whack. And the dog's already been marked. It turns to its left, and it goes and gets the toy. Hey, when you guys first start this, don't freak out if the, you go, you mark it, and the dog's just like looking it at, at you like... It's fine, right? Uh, they'll get through this. And again, you've marked it. You've already marked the behavior. He's free. If it takes him 10 seconds to find the tug, that's okay. So you throw it behind your back. It hits the wall. He's still looking at you. Just calmly walk over. There it is, buddy. Show it to him. Pick it up. Play. Do it a few more times. And usually after one or two sessions, they understand when you mark it, they are already peeling off to the left. This will help a lot because if, if – um, and. You know, Rich talked about the confusion with the gun, but if you're paying from your right side all the time, you're going to get a dog that's called what we call crabbing or crowding, where they're walking sideways, walking partially in front of you, and they're looking at your right side because that's where the toy comes from. So by paying behind your back or um, having the toy in your left pocket, marking it, and then coming up and paying them with that manner, um, it's gonna you're going to avoid that whole you know, crowding, crabbing type situation. Yeah, I think we have a really good video here uh, where Phil is w walking also with the with the toy on the left video, side yeah. of the dog. So it just he just walking with his arm down by his side. Toy is on the left side, right next to the dog, and the dog is still looking up at Phil, waiting for that marker. Phil gives it the marker, and then the dog goes and gets the toy, even though the toy is right next to the dog's face. Essentially, the toy is not what gets the dog rewarded. The focus on us, asking us to do the positions that we put the dog in, is what gets them rewarded. The, the toy is just the, uh, the the delivery of the reward. It in reality, if you do this right, it doesn't matter where your toy is, right? It could be on your right side, it could be under your right arm, it could be under your left arm, right pocket, left pocket, back pocket, laying on the grass, or like in the video, right next to his head on the other side. And how do you achieve that? Through markers, communication. Right, allowing the dog to make the mistake, correcting it, teaching him the only way to get that toy is give me proper obedience, and that's the, in the video. You see that it looks really good. That's that's what Phil did. It was all foundational stuff, very basic. You know, it goes back to you guys got to work your basics. We all want to do this fancy stuff and have dogs come shooting back off of release or a beautiful call off, and you haven't put in this time here in the basics. You don't won't have flashy obedience until you've worked the fundamentals and the basics with the toy. And the same the same uh, ability for the dog to ignore the toy prior to hearing the marker is going to help you out in uh, in toy delivery for detection as well. If I bring out my toy and I'm flinging tugs and doesn't matter, the dog's searching. Uh, I've got the ball out, I've got the tug out, whatever, but the, the dog doesn't care because the dog understands the only way to get the delivery on this is through the marker, then the dog's just going to search. It's going to search until it finds the odor. It's going to lock up on the odor. Boom, marker, yes, chuck the toy. Yes, and the dog's like, oh, I, you know, I can walk into this room. You can have all the tugs in the world. You can be playing with the tugs. You can be juggling tugs. It doesn't matter because the only way I get them is from the marker. The only way I hear the marker is from alerting to the odor. So this... This ability for the dog to clearly understand that the only way it gets the toy is when it hears the marker will be helpful for the, everything that you do with your dog. Obedience, bite work, and detection. Correct. Right. So we've just talked about rewarding the dog behind the back. We've got a video of that. Um, you can watch the handler do that. Um, the other way is you can have the, do the, the, the dog, you can have the, t the toy in your right hand and be healing and then mark it. And then when you mark it, you explode backwards, pull the toy out. So you're actually giving the toy to the dog face on. Again, we're trying to avoid this coming up with the toy for two reasons. It creates really bad habits and the dog's positioning is, is compromised. And later on, that could be your gun, right? So for those two reasons, get away from rewarding on the right. Uh, the other way is at what we call remote pay where the toy is out already on the field. I go out to the field, put my dog in a sit. I toss my toy. He sees it. And in the beginning, he's looking at the toy. I just get, I just want focus. I start to heal. As soon as he falls into a heel and looks up once, I mark it. He gets to go get it laying on the ground, right? And then from there, we can start building upon that. And if you've already built a nice heel, 
um, he will piece this together pretty quickly. Don't on the remote uh, reward. Don't get lazy with your dog. So just him going to get the toy. Remember, he's going to get the dead bird, right? So if he runs out there and he gets the toy and you're like, hey, that's cool. He got his toy and he just is out there with it. When he gets the toy, you get excited. You bring him back into you. And then that tug play starts. It's the, the engagement with you that makes the toys valuable. 100% on that one. Can't, can't stress that enough. So don't be a dud. You, know, you got to do the work. <laughs> Nobody wants to play with a dud. Nobody wants to play with a dud. So, uh, so moving on from the obedience, let's talk about the bite work. This is the big stuff right here. This is where it all pays off. And this is where I think a lot of people get reluctant to use the toy because they are worried that every time the dog lets go that they have to pay them uh, with a toy for the remainder of the dog's life. That's absolutely not true. Um, if you have ever been a child or raised a child, we know that when children are toddlers, we reward them for all kinds of things that we don't reward them for when they're 15 right? Everything's fun when you're a toddler. We're making everything positive. We're just pointing out dangers. But when you're 15, you're cleaning your room, you're doing your homework, you're eating your dinner, you're doing all that stuff because I said so. So right now in the beginning stages of teaching the things that are exciting to a dog, we're making everything exciting and everything fun. But at some point they're going to do it because you said so, but because there's a foundational relationship of fun that was built there to allow me to say, no, now just do it because I said. And then there's hope for reward. And that hope for reward for the rest of the dog's life is what keeps the dog motivated, just like it keeps the uh, retiree at the casino motivated to keep pulling the handle, right? That variable reward, that hope for reward is what keeps people in casinos and makes dogs want to work for you. So in the beginning, uh, just like everything else, we're going to start in the luring phase, right? Is it, There's a theme here, right? We start with the lure. Once the dog's giving us the behavior somewhat with the lure present, then we start to remove the lure. And then once the dog has an understanding of the behavior, now we expect it. And now we combine everything. So here we go. Um, we got the dog on a back tie. Um, and we're going to show a video of a, a really young dog. This handler has just gotten this dog. Um, it's a green dog. And so dog is on the bite. He's biting. And this was in a, a decoy class. So, um, you know. Everything might not be perfect in the bite. So, and hey, all these videos we're showing you guys, and we're having th throw up on the screen. This is just like regular training. These weren't scripted. Yeah. It wasn't like, hey, let's get our best dogs and let's take do five yeah. takes on this. This was just regular training. Right. So you might hear an extra command here and there. You might not see perfection in the training, um, but it is what it is. It's 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 honest. So. Um, it's just a random selection. So um, on this on this particular video, the dog's going to be biting. Um, handler's going to back up. He's going to tell the dog to release. And he's got this big old thing. The barrel tug. The barrel tug. This is like crack for dogs if, if you guys haven't, haven't ever used one of these. Um, and it, it's okay for some dogs. Like they really like biting the decoy. Obviously, that's why we selected them. So to compete a little bit with that excitement, you can go a little bit bigger in, in, in this, type of, uh, this type of tug. We've even used a, a sleeve where the handler doesn't have it on, and he has it extended like a toy. And real quick, sidebar on that, guys, those of you that are going out from one decoy and letting the dog reward on another decoy and out off that decoy and reward on another decoy, I get it if you're working your outs in the beginning. I'm not a real fan of that exercise because you're teaching the dog out, come off, potentially go bite somebody else, and that somebody else is usually a uh, cover, cover off. officer. I was working with an agency that has a dog on the street, and he outed off the decoy, and I was standing there, and the dog immediately looked at me. It was coming with me. Thank the Lord. He had a friggin' 15-foot line and was good with it because this was like an 85-pound Dutchie that I didn't <laughs> want to tangle with, and he had previously been taught that exercise. So... Um, something to be really careful about is the out off of one man back to another guy. Like, um, I'm, I'm not a fan. So, but anyway, um, initially this is here, the dog outs, as soon as he outs, it starts coming back. What are we going to do in between the time he outs and he bites this marker? Yes, exactly. Yes. Like, yes. yes, that's what I mean. Yes. <laughs> so, um, as soon as he outs, yes, as he comes back in and we're setting that foundation that the marker precedes the bite. So now where we go from here. 
So, and, and just to clarify that, uh, it's preferable that our bite work is low value and that the toy, like Greg just ha had out, is extremely high value, right? So, a uh, couple things that we can do to make the bite work low value. If your dog loves being on the suit then, and, the, and the sleeve isn't as exciting for the dog, then we have the dog biting the sleeve, outs the sleeve, comes to the big toy. If for some reason the suit's not as valuable, then you can be on the suit. But also it's important that the decoy in this situation, when we go to out the dog, is flat, boring, not moving, right? Again, the bird has died. Decoy is there. Out. It's way easier for the dog to out off of a, a limp decoy than it is for the decoy that's jumping around and still screaming. That's not easy for a dog to let go of. So calm the decoy down. Dog outs immediately to a high value toy uh, like Greg just had. Go yeah. And, and in the beginning, we, we've already done this, right? You did it with the toys. So you've already taught the dog the behaviors. You've taught him the out command. We've already, he understands how to work through a little bit of pressure and he understands there's a reward on the other side of it. So now all we're doing is changing the picture slightly. So um, right here, when you're saying out um, and the dog doesn't do it, um, you can overlay a, some some positive punishment or a little bit of negative reinforcement prior to, if you'd like to, um, with the e-collar or uh, positive punishment with the pinch. And then the dog understands the behavior, right? Well, that's one of our rules. We don't overlay any compulsion unless the dog has an understanding of that behavior. But we've already set that up with the toys. And then once he does it, here comes, here comes the reward. So the next step is, and for, in the beginning, again, we're luring the tug is out there. The next step... There is no tug present, right? So the dog, we tell the dog to out. The dog releases, whether he does it on his own or with some pressure. As soon as he releases and looks back at the handler, he's got him online. He then marks it, and then the toy now comes out. So now it's the toy is not there. Um, guys, you can't be up on your dog, like going out, out. And, and I still see guys out, out. You know, that's the luring phase. You got to move past that um, and, and you got to address that. It, the, the toy should not have to be present to get the behavior. But if you can't get a heel, a focused heel like you had with your toy, when your toy is away, how are you going to expect to get this behavior? So we go from luring in the heel to take that away and the dog still gives a focused heel. We're doing the same thing now. We're going from outing the man to a toy, mm -hmm. initially, that's the lure. Now we're outing the man, let go because I said so, good job, mark it, and then it comes out. And then we move into a variable reward after that, and then we move into no reward. Yeah, and then, then sometimes I'll go ahead and reward. So here's the thing, you guys don't become predictable. So sometimes the dog outs, he comes into a heel, there is no toy. Sometimes he outs on his way back, I mark it, and the toy comes out. And sometimes he comes back to a heel. We do another behavior. I start healing away. He gets paid for that. the heel as we heal away. He comes back. He heals. He put him in a sit. He gets paid for that. Just mix it up. Don't, don't always do the same thing. And we all know about variable rewards, and that's a whole other subject. But by varying it up and you're creating hope that he thinks he's going to get it, and when he doesn't get it, and he's only getting it every third time or every fourth time or every second time, again, it, it – you don't know. You don't don't get on a fixed ratio where it's every third time he outs him giving him his toy. Keep him guessing. Sometimes give it to him twice in a row, then he doesn't see it four times in a row. Uh, there's science behind this. There's more dopamine being released in the brain because the dog doesn't know when he's getting it. He starts to work harder for it, trying to figure out how to unlock that box. So um, use that to your advantage, but you got to get away from the luring phase once he's giving the behavior predictably. Can we clarify something on the bite work? And I think this is uh, something that you use operationally with all the dogs that are in your group. Why is it important that when the dog lets go of the suspect or the decoy in this case, that the dog comes back for the reward instead of getting rewarded again with the suspect? Yeah. So there is a, a lot of methods that work on the outing and then maybe downing and then giving them another bite. Or like in some of the sports, they out and they go into a guard. Um, KMPV does a rear guard and IPO um, or IPG. They do a, they do they get in front right and and there's there's the reward for that. And the dogs outs are usually pretty daggone good because yep. they enjoy the guard right. 
The problem in law enforcement is I don't want my dog anywhere near that suspect. When I say release, I want him to come back. And if you're outing and downing him and then rewarding him with another bite, a couple things on the out and down. Number one, your decoys generally don't appreciate it because they out, down, and what are they next to? Foot. They're next to a foot. So if the dog's going to get dirty, he could grab a foot. Um, yeah, on the street, we don't want it out, down, and then the suspect goes to move and the dog reengages. So we want the dog to come back to us. We want the reward by, you know, back at the handler. Um, I understand if early developmental stages, if you're going to go out and give the bite again, out and give the bite again, but try not to stay there too long because we really don't want that behavior on the street. Yeah, and I think it's really important to reiterate that. We see it, and it works, like you said, really nice in sport, out, but as what happens is the decoy stops. Suspects don't stop, right? You out. If I leave that dog at the foot of the suspect and the suspect's still upset, angry, uh, sad, emotional, whatever the suspect is doing, and it includes some flinching and some moving around, that is likely going to be enough to entice my dog to rebite. And that's a problem. Yep. So we need, that's why we are rewarding and encouraging the dog to come back to us. Yeah, and everything comes back to the handler, and then the handler can redirect to a, a, another decoy if they want or or back to the toy or whatever it is. I think for all of this, it's important to know that we're doing the same thing in different situations from the beginning of this work till the end of it. We're, we're teaching the dog to like something. We're teaching the dog to lure to that. We're teaching the dog that when it's looking at that thing or it's, you know, it's coming back to that thing, that we mark it, yes, and the dog gets it and that the dog doesn't get it again until it hears that marker. So we have to understand how to lure. We have to understand how to mark. We have to really understand variable reward and to take the lure away from it altogether so the dog's motivated to do it for the hope of getting the reward, not because it sees the reward every time. Correct. And then our communication is such that the dog only bites the toy when you use the marker. And so you can be healing along. I'll show a video of, of me and my, my last dog, Rango. Um, I can heal along and drop that toy right on his head, right? And he doesn't bite it. Why? Because there was no marker. There was no marker. So it doesn't matter where the toy is. You don't get to bite it unless... It, and guess what? That breeds a very confident dog because he knows the rules. I'm not punishing him for something one day and then allowing it the other. And that's the worst thing you can do with your relationship with your dog, and that's how you deteriorate the confidence in your dog, is your wishy-washy and your communication. And so, I mean, we've talked about it before in all aspects of dog training. But if you keep the rules the same, and it doesn't matter what the rules are. In this case, the rules are you only bite it when I, when I mark it. It doesn't matter if it's present it, present. it doesn't matter if it's in my pocket. It doesn't matter if it falls on your head. It doesn't matter if it's laying on the ground next to you. If those are the rules, then it sets the, the tone for re the relationship. And now we don't have some mistakes like, let's talk about some of the concerns we had in the beginning, the, our naysayers, right? Yep. Who don't want to use toys. What are, what are some of the things we discussed in the beginning? Number one, uh, the gun thing, right? If, if, even if I take my toy and I draw it like a gun, um, the dog shouldn't bite it. Why? Because I didn't mark it. Um, I'm going to show some video real quick here of some of our handlers when uh, the dog was coming back. Um, we, we ran this because we knew we were going to do this podcast, and we're like, well, let's see how our dogs do. And as the dogs were coming back, all our handlers drew a gun. We didn't have one dog come up and look at the gun as, as a potential for the toy. I think this is a good time also for you handlers that are listening to this, and if you don't want to throw yourself out there in front of your group, totally understandable, go in your backyard with your dog, grab your tug or your ball on a rope, and put it in front of your dog's nose. If your dog mugs it and steals it from you, your dog doesn't understand the marker and it doesn't understand respect. If you have the ball on a rope and you stand with your dog in a heel position and you drop the ball on the ground and you have to fight your dog to get him off the uh, ball on a rope that you just dropped in front of it, your dog does not understand the marker system and your dog doesn't respect you and understand that the reward comes from you. We've been there. Uh, I long before I learned any of the marker stuff I had my first police dog I didn't know any of this and I assumed that when I presented it that's when the dog got it that was my only understanding of how the reward worked here it is you take it didn't know how the marker worked and that was the relationship we had for the entirety of me working with that dog 
as time went on and I learned the marker and I learned how to use that, then I was able to demand that respect and I was able to keep the dog motivated on it because I also don't want the dog to lose desire for the toy or the tug uh, because it's not present. I want it to still have that same hope and desire, that capping, to do the behavior because he thinks he's going to get rewarded at some point. I want to keep that hope alive. And it's that hope that makes him work for me. Again, we go back to the casino thing. Casinos stole variable rewards and used it to make themselves rich. And, and it works great. People go in there and they gamble their, their retirements away because of the hope of reward, right? We want the dog to have that same feeling. Yeah. Hey, we talked about four things that we hear all the time. We talked about guns. Dogs will bite the gun, right? I think we can dispel that. Um, the dog expects the demands a toy every time they out. Well, we're using a variable reward system, just like Rich talked about. So I think we can take that, that off the plate. Um, <clears throat> the dog, um, thinks something's a toy that's on the ground, right? You're not marking it. And I still encourage our dogs love toys. Um, but generally if you selected the right dog, they really like biting the man more than the toy. So we'll take sleeves and have our decoy run away, throw sleeves at them, throw tugs at them, throw balls at them. If you're not doing that, you're missing the boat. Um, throw, ba- throw backpacks at them. Throw, throw backpacks at them. Yeah, throw. I had that happen on the street where the suspect took a backpack, tried to feed it to my dog, and I was watching going, oh, you son of a gun, do not bite that backpack. <laughs> and he didn't, thank the Lord. Um, but he had seen it in training. Um, but he was also a good dog. So What about too sporty? Too sporty. So here's my thing, and I've had guys go, you know, we don't use toys in bite work. Um, you know, I'll use it for obedience, but I'm, my question would be, well, why do you use the toy in obedience? Well, because it gives a more solid behavior. You get a dog that's willing to do these behaviors, right? There's um, a lot more enthusiasm to do it. So my, my, my thing would be, well, then why aren't you using it in the bite work? And if you're using it properly in the bite work and you're not using it for lure, but you're using it once the dog has completed the behavior, then you're, you're missing out. And so the two sporty things that cop out, and I'll be honest with you, the best call-offs I see and the best outs I see – Go to your, your local uh, sport club. Uh, go to Phil's Ring Sport Club. 100-yard uh, send, and they're calling those dogs off within five feet. And then you're like, oh, well, then they must be slow, slow dogs and, and not very motivated. The opposite. They're super fast mouths that are just trained to just go down there and, and hit the decoy when the decoy is trying to escape, and it's flashy as heck. But the, the thing about you watch these sport dogs is the amazing ability they have – to do the activities with enthusiasm and the amount of drive they have, but the clarity they have at the same time. And that's why a balanced program by using positive reinforcement along with some of the other parts of operant conditioning will give you that balance. And really that's what we're looking for with these toys. We're trying to balance it out. So you're not just out there, you know, having to go compulsion the whole time. And we've been there and we've talked about this in previous podcasts. We understand that training with pure compulsion works to get from one point to the next we get it you can go out there and you can yank a crank a dog into a sit and a down and a recall and all those things but they're never doing it because they want to do it they're always avoiding discomfort and if you have a dog that's always doing something because it's afraid of the consequences that's a different dog that's doing it because it likes what it's doing and it's looking forward to the reward um, and actually this, this carries over also to like calmer grips, right? You get a little more clarity. You're not having to, um, rely on the compulsion. It's not all about punishment. We talked about relationship, how important that is. And I'll say it again, discipline without rapport equals rebellion. Um, so it helps with your relationship with your dog. You can go out, you can do a five minute obedience session, using a toy, throwing it over there, um, throwing it on the ground, doing a remote reward, marking it, letting them get it, interacting with them. And at the same time, you're, you're building that relationship. You're building the basic skills they're going to need for the street. Um, it's just, honestly, it, it, if, if you're not using a toy right now, it's, 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 uh, you're missing the boat. But, um, but obviously, there's a lot of facets to it. So we just skimmed across a lot of these. Um, this is not a, a design to be a A through Z how-to, um, but kind of maybe uh, give you guys some ideas of maybe where you're going awry in your, your um, use of the toy during uh, your your training. Yeah, we know there's a lot of a lot of training groups out there. Um, I came from one where toys were not allowed. I went to two basics where toys were not allowed, food was not allowed. Um, 
And if you're in one of those groups, you are run, <laughs> run as far as fast as you can. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you are a little stuck and you need to find something better, but at least start doing this in your backyard, maybe when nobody's looking um, and start seeing the kind of behavior that you can get out of your dog. It's going to be a huge difference if you're only used to, uh, you know, doing Keeler type method with your dog. Uh, high compulsion and you start adding some toy and some reward into it you're going to see how much fun it can be to work with a dog hey and that's you said it this is going to be a lot more fun for you and for the the animal you got to work with so yeah in the meantime yeah train hard with tugs and be safe